Without a shadow of a doubt, travelling long distance in an electric car is much easier than it used to be. I mean, without dramatically expanded rapid charging provision across the US, I would have struggled to recently drive Winter's CCS-equipped Chevrolet Bolt EV from Boston, Massachusetts to Portland, Oregon in just seven days. Thanks to dramatic improvements in reliability and provision, my trip, while still requiring some planning, was relatively hassle-free, something that I must have for the industry if the majority of citizens are to make the switch to electric vehicles. And to be clear, that's a switch that we're going to need to see happen if we want any chance of minimising the effects of anthropogenic climate change. But as Winter discovered a week after I had arrived on the West Coast, driving across the US in his other car, a Tesla Model 3, was even easier thanks to Tesla's extensive and comprehensive network of superchargers. Built out over the last eight years, the supercharger network is one of the reasons people choose a Tesla over rival brands. But if you happen to own a non-Tesla, I'm guessing there's been at least one point in your life at which you've looked over at a Tesla supercharger and wished your car could sip on some Elon electrons in order to complete its journey. To date, it's not been possible, despite what some misinformed YouTube channels have been telling people, with only Tesla destination chargers being compatible with non-Tesla cars when paired with a Tesla to J1772 charging adapter. Although, as you might have heard in the last week, that is about to change, with Elon Musk confirming that Tesla will be opening its network to non-Tesla cars. So today, I'm going to go over what we know about Tesla's plans to open up its supercharger network, what it will mean for you, a non-Tesla owner, and what you should know if you're wanting to give it a go. First, let's cover a few basic things about the supercharger network because there's a lot of confusion over what connectors we're actually talking about. When Tesla first launched the supercharger network in the US, it did so with its own proprietary connector, a connector that is unique to Tesla's cars. Every car it has made and sold in the US and Canada since the original Tesla Model S has made use of that charging connector, but not the original Tesla Roadster, which had its own proprietary charger inlet, that couldn't handle DC quick charging, but could charge at rates of up to 19 and a bit kilowatts when using a compatible AC quick charge station. In Europe and some other parts of the world, mostly markets where the Type 2 charging connector was popular for AC charging, Tesla's vehicles used a different inlet. While it looked identical to the Type 2 AC charging connector, Tesla's version was found in Tesla vehicles and at its superchargers, but it was a little deeper. This, for example, allowed Teslas in Europe to make use of AC single and three-phase charging stations without needing a charging adapter, but it did not make it possible for non-Teslas with Type 2 inlets to use Tesla's supercharger technology, or indeed Tesla destination chargers, since Tesla's version of the connector, while pin and electrically identical, was a little deeper in its dimensions. Eventually, however, thanks to European Union legislation about EV rapid charging standardization, Tesla switched to building cars with CCS Type 2 charging inlets just a few years ago, meaning that Teslas in Europe, parts of Asia, Australia and New Zealand, among others, all have CCS inlets. For a while, Tesla even built its supercharger stations in those markets with dual-headed provision, one charging cable for CCS and one for the original modified Type 2 Tesla-style connector. This not only meant that newer Tesla supercharger sites are fully mechanically compatible with CCS inlets on non-Teslas, but it means that Teslas can use non-Tesla charging stations. If you're outside of markets where Teslas have CCS Type 2 inlets, that might feel like a mind-blowing revelation. But if you're the owner of a new Tesla in Europe, it also means that you've got far more places to plug in than your counterparts in North America. 
Which brings me to how we are at, where we are at today. The confirmation that Tesla is opening up its network to other vehicles from rival automakers. It will start in Europe, where it's been required law since 2014 that all charging networks operate DC quick charging using the CCS charge standard. As part of a push towards making EV infrastructure more widespread and accessible, there's also significant funding opportunities available for charging network operators who open up their network to all customers of all brands. And obviously it's in Tesla's best interests from a business point of view to take advantage of the European wide charging standard and open up its network to non-Teslas. I understand Germany and Norway are expected to be the first markets to open up to non-Tesla customers at superchargers, but it's not going to stop there, or in other European countries, or indeed countries like Australia and New Zealand, which follow European charging standards as well. In North America, where Tesla has its own proprietary connector for its cars, things will be a little more difficult. While Tesla superchargers operate on a common rapid charger communications protocol, there's no homogeneity between, say, a Tesla supercharger connector and a CCS Type 1 charging inlet. And that means Tesla, and I suspect others, will develop mechanical adapters to allow non-Tesla owners to use a Tesla supercharger. Tesla has indeed already confirmed that it's begun designing just such an adapter, and it will be selling it to non-Tesla customers through its usual retail locations and online store. It's also hinted that some supercharger locations will have adapters at them to allow CCS customers to use North American superchargers. So far, so good. There's no word yet on how much a Tesla CCS to supercharger adapter will be, but we do have some past examples to base estimates on. For some time now, Tesla has produced a Chademo charging adapter to let Tesla owners use a Chademo charging station to charge their North American specification Model S, Model X, Model 3, or Model Y. It retailed for around 400 US dollars, or rather technically still does, but it hasn't been in stock for a while. Rather than simply be a physical connector, I believe this particular unit includes some electronics in the handle in order to ensure proper communication between charging station and car. Although I might be wrong and please tell me if I am. Tesla also makes a CCS Type 2 to Tesla Type 2 adapter designed to allow older Tesla owners, I mean owners of older Teslas, to charge at new CCS supercharger sites. And it also makes CCS Combo 2 non-Tesla DC quick charge stations a possibility. That retails from 170 euro, which is about 190 US dollars. At the same time, Tesla also makes the exact opposite adapter, which allows owners of newer Teslas to use older supercharging hardware. Since a CCS to Tesla supercharger adapter is unlikely to have much in the way of electronics in it and will be more about physical, mechanical adaptation, I'm guessing two to three hundred dollars would be a safe guesstimate in terms of price. Now we know how to physically connect up to a Tesla supercharger, what about the actual experience of charging? For Tesla owners, using a supercharger is as simple as turning up, plugging in and walking away. That's because cars are authenticated automatically, but for non-Tesla owners, there will be a few more steps to get you charging. Elon Musk has said that Tesla is developing a revision to the Tesla app, which will give non-Tesla owners the ability to activate a charging session from their phone. They will, of course, have to register for a Tesla account if they don't already have one, and they'll need to keep their payment details on file and up to date in order to ensure they can actually pay for those charging sessions. There won't be any RFID cards or broken credit card readers, as you so often find at other charging stations operated by other charging networks. Some, specifically those who do like the concept of swiping their credit card or faffing around with a broken RFID card reader, rather than having another membership to deal with, might not like this, especially if there's someone who doesn't own a smartphone. Yes, there are still people out there who don't have smartphones for whatever reason. But for what it's worth, Tesla's proposed approach seems to be the most seamless and easy to use for non-Tesla owners. Obviously, if you live in a country where Tesla already uses CCS connectors, you won't need an adapter. But in countries where Tesla uses its own connector, you will need one. 
Tesla has hinted that some, if not all, sites will have adapters available for customers to use. But I think most people would rather carry one than rely on an unknown one. Which brings me to the actual cost of using these superchargers. Like most charging networks today, Tesla plans on grading its costs to charge based on how quickly your car can charge. But rather than charge cars that use higher power levels more to charge, it will do the exact opposite, stating that it will charge customers more whose cars take longer to fill up. This might seem counterintuitive, after all, the more power you use, the more the charging station provider has to pay to provide you with that power. But in this instance, Tesla clearly wants to ensure its own customers aren't stuck behind someone in, say, a Chevy Bolt who was taking twice as long to charge as they would. Side note, as a Bolt EV owner, it takes me about 30 to 45 minutes to get to 80% state of charge, depending on how full the car is when I pull in. I personally shoot for charging sessions of no more than 30 minutes long because I like to charge more frequently and stop more frequently than some drivers out there. It's actually a little faster to charge to say 60% and move on than it is to go all the way to 80. But I know plenty who prefer to just charge until their car is full. For Tesla though, which prides itself on getting customers in and out of supercharger sites, and for whom congestion is already a problem, that is the last thing it needs. Hence the costing more to charge more slowly. Tesla has also hinted that it will most certainly use time of use tariffs, meaning the cost to charge may and most likely will vary depending on where you're charging and when. Unlike some networks, which have fairly flat tariffs, expect Tesla's supercharger network fees to vary for non-Teslas. I can even imagine, for example, Tesla pushing up the cost of non-Teslas to use its network when demand from Tesla owners is high. Think packet shaping from networking, but for EV charging instead. Now, my thoughts on this all. I am very pleased to see Tesla help encourage more EVs by embracing other non-Teslas at its charging stations. I think the whole move could make it easier than ever before for non-Tesla owners to road trip. Even if they can't make use of the incredibly fast charging speeds Tesla now offers at its V3 superchargers. However, if this isn't carried out properly, it could and might be a disaster for both sides. Tesla already has congestion issues at its supercharger sites in parts of North America and Europe. Adding new charging customers to an already strained system could pose major technical problems, especially for Tesla customers who frankly paid extra to have exclusive access to Tesla's network. I think it's clear that this move is also driven by some of the incentives that are only available to charging providers who are vehicle and standard agnostic. Governments around the world want to see more charging infrastructure and Tesla has a whole lot ready there to go. This is easy money for Tesla as long as it can implement everything correctly. Pricing is going to be a challenge too. Tesla has a habit of suddenly changing its pricing seemingly on a whim and that could cause a backlash among non-Tesla owners who are used to more stable pricing for DC charging. But there is a big flip side of this all. The fact that gas stations do it all the time and nobody complains. This news is, frankly, the best thing to happen to charging networks for a long time and I think it could dramatically change how easy it is to get behind the wheel of an EV. Moreover, it provides another competitor in the marketplace of EV charging and competition generally leads to better things from customers. And I, personally, I can't wait to try it all out. Finally, as to the question as to why automakers haven't taken up Tesla on its previous offers, well, that's a thorny subject. Fairly soon after the Model S and the Supercharger Network launched, Elon Musk announced that Tesla would share its patents to the rest of the auto industry in the now famous All Our Patents Are Belong To You blog post of June 2014. Elon Musk offered Tesla's technology to any other automaker hoping to make an EV. It was hoped at the time by many Tesla fans that those automakers would take up Tesla on their offer 
and it would allow Tesla to expand its supercharger network through mutual agreement between rival firms. Essentially, Tesla had hoped for a quid pro quo arrangement where rival automakers would share Tesla's tech and Tesla would share theirs under the mutual agreement that they would not sue each other or any other automaker for copyright infringement of EV technology. And when it came to charging, Tesla wanted other automakers to contribute funds towards the operation of the combined supercharger network or grant access to Tesla customers on an equivalent network. Since most legacy automakers had and have no interest in their own charging networks, that fell flat. And I'm guessing the legal departments were wary of the language in Tesla's open source quid pro quo offers. This way though, this way is how Tesla has circumvented it, earning some pennies in the process from the oodles of government grants currently being offered around the globe to expand EV charging on a standard agnostic basis. This one, I think, was very well played by Tesla, indeed. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe as well as the bell if you haven't yet, as it should make sure that you don't miss out on our videos. And don't forget to do the same to our two other channels, Transport Evolved Take Two, and if you're in a hurry, Transport Evolved Shorts. Thanks on behalf of the entire T crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, that's Andrew Martin, Guida Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Carl Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda and Tesla in the Gong, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. They are John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin and Kofi. You can chat with the team and tea fans over at Discord, especially if you want to keep on talking about this particular video. And don't forget that you can also visit our swag store where we have some really cool swag, just like this t-shirt for you all to buy. Although I'm not sure anybody wants to buy a Bolt EV t-shirt right now, but somebody did ask the other day, there is a Tesla version. I'll be back soon with more great content, but until then, keep evolving. <laughs>